there are, when we talk about pulmonary measurements, we're going to divide them into two groups, volumes and capacities. Volumes basically are the building block that you end up having where capacities are made up of two or more volumes. There are four lung volumes, but only three of which we can measure with simple spirometry, meaning at a bedside having a measurement done. Okay. The first one you probably have never heard of, but it's called tidal volume. No, you've heard of it. Okay. Tidal volume, which is roughly five to eight milliliters per kilogram in, a, in, in our theoretical 70 kilogram healthy male it's, it's about 500 milliliters. So for our purpose, we'll call this volume roughly 500 milliliters. The second volume is what's called the inspiratory reserve volume, and it's the additional volume you can take above the tidal volume until you can't take any more. So if you take a normal breath in, and then continue taking a breath in above that until you can't take anything else in, that additional volume is the inspiratory reserve volume, or IRV. That volume is actually pretty huge. It's about 3,100 milliliters, so roughly six times your tidal volume. The expiratory reserve volume is the volume that you can exhale after a normal exhalation. So when I'm at rest, the additional amount I can blow out, and that's about 1,200. And then finally, we talked about this previously, there's some amount of air that's in your lungs that you can never under normal er circumstances exhale, and that's called the RV, the residual volume, which is also about 1,200. And it's the one volume that we can't measure with simple spirometry. We've got to do some sophisticated pulmonary function studies to be able to ascertain what that va value is. And obviously in lung disease, what we're going to find is that these values are askew. They're not correct. Okay? When they're not where they should be. Those four volumes combine to make four capacities. The first one, as the name implies, is probably a, a, a vital one because it's a vital capacity. And it's the sum of the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. If I were to ask you to take as deep of a breath as you possibly can, and blow it out until you can't blow out any more, you now have done a vital capacity. Maximum of volume in, maximum volume out. So it's basically everything but the, but the residual volume in the process. I can do this as a slow maneuver, have the patient take a deep breath and blow out slowly as much as they can. Or we're going to find there's a measurement called a forced vital capacity where we blow it out very hard, blast it out as hard as you can. No, under normal circumstances, they should be the same, but we'll find patients with obstructive, patients with lung disease, certain types of lung disease, will have a big difference between the two because that forced maneuver actually causes the airways to collapse. IRV, tidal volume, ERV, vital capacity. Inspiratory capacity is the volume of air that can be e inhaled after a normal exhalation. So it's the sum of the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. Has, have any of you um, either been in the hospital with surgery or seen somebody who's had surgery and they give them this little device and they have them take a breath in? Take a deep breath, Mr. Jones. Some of them have balls involved, yes. <laughs> One of my uh, colleagues walked into the patient's room, and the guy said, I'm sorry, I just can't get your balls up. And it's like, 
It just sounded wrong, but okay. What they were doing was an inspiratory capacity, okay? It's called incentive spirometry, and the goal of that is to encourage patients to take a deep breath. If, you, if you've had abdominal surgery, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I will tell you, if you rip open somebody's belly, they're not too happy taking a deep breath. They want nothing to do with it, okay? Unfortunately, that lack of lung expansion can lead to um, the development of uh, pneumonia and some pretty ugly complications. Functional residual capacity, I think we've talked about before. This is the volume of air that's inside the thorax at the end of a normal exhalation. Basically, the sum of the ERV and the RV. And then finally, the total lung capacity is obviously everything summed up together. There is, there is another uh, value that we have where we look at a ratio between the residual volume and total lung capacity. Well, bless you. <laughs> Sounded like a poodle. Um, and we'll talk more, more about that concept later. Graphically, if we were to look at this, this is what it would look like. I have the patient. I have the patient breathing naturally. I'm measuring the tidal volume. Take a deep breath in, deep, 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 deep. Now blow it out, push, 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 squeeze, 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 squeeze. Keep going, keep going, go, 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 keep going. I now have measured the vital capacity. And hopefully they keep breathing. Okay. But you can see there's some that there is a portion of this that is never measured. And that's the residual volume. And anything that has residual volume as a component of it can't be measured directly. Do you understand what I just said? I got an idea. I got a feeling I probably needed to. We can't measure the residual volume with simple spirometry. At the bedside, we can't measure that. Any capacity that has residual volume as a component of it, I can't measure at the bedside either. And those two capacities are the FRC and the TLC, M-O-U-S-E. That was a joke. Correct. Because residual volume is a component of them. This is known as Rick's lung box. This will become your friend or the bane of your existence, as the case may be. If you talk to people who are former grads, they'll tell you Rick and his lung box. <laughs> yeah, I corrupted them well. Now, not only do you need to know what these are, you need to know their normal values. And as I said, the inspiratory reserve volume is 3,100. Tidal volume is 500. ERV is 1,200. Residual volume is 1,200. Pardon me? All, all in milliliters, yes. No, it's 3,100. That's just my little things in the way there. That'd be kind of small, wouldn't it? <coughs> now, you'll see this depicted with some of the columns inner, inner space or in twist it around, what it, it doesn't matter. It all adds up to the same, okay? <clears throat> the inspiratory capacity is the sum of the inspiratory reserve volume and the tidal volume, so it's 3,600. Functional residual capacity is the sum of the expiratory reserve volume and residual volume, 2,400. Vital capacity is the sum of these three volumes, 4,800. TLC, 
sum of everything. And yes, you do need to know not only the technical term, but also the volume that we would theoretically have. I don't know of an easy way to do this other than just drawing the box and memorizing it. You say that now. Okay, how did you get 3,100, 500, and 1,200? 3,600 and 1,200 is 4,800. Yeah. Okay. So this is just one of those, I'll um, look at somebody's test and the minute I give them to them, they draw the lung box. Is a brain dump. So far, so good? What? Yeah, that stays. It's just it happens to be in two spots so that we can have the vital capacity. And if you notice, if you add them all up, no matter which column you add, it adds up to 6,000. So we're back to our total lung capacity. It's kind of a double check on yourself. <clears throat> these are just kind of some directions on how to how you would coach a patient to be able to measure these. Tidal volume obviously is breathing in and out. Inspiratory reserve volume at the end of a normal exhalation at the end of a normal inhalation, excuse me, take in the, uh, the additional amount of air you can take in. Expiratory reserve at the end of a normal exhalation, continue exhaling until you can't do anything more. Again, we can't measure the residual volume. And in the distinction between a slow vital capacity and a, fat and a um, forced vital capacity is one we're exhaling very slow and the other one we're blasting out as hard as we can, hard and fast as we can. Inspiratory capacity, again, that incentive spirometry, having them take a deep breath in from a normal exhalation. And the last two, again, we can't measure because residual volume is a component of it. All right. Now this is where Egan and Beachy get a little bit flaky. Okay. It's raining in Carroll, just in case you care. Um, because they have resid residual volume as a component, <coughs> the FRC and TLC can't be measured. So what we typically measure is we measure the FRC. And if I know my ERV, which I can measure, I'll determine what the residual volume is. The value that we actually measure, though, is the FRC. And the way Beachy and Egan explain this, they go through each of these three individual tests and explain what they're like. I don't care that you know that necessarily. I do want you to know that there's three methods by which we determine FRC and therefore determine RV. One is called the helium dilution, and I want you to know that this is a closed circuit. The second method is a nitrogen washout, and this is an open. And the third one is body plethysmography. One of those words you just love to roll off your tongue. And what I want you to know is that this is based upon Boyle's law. Boyle's law is what? You are too good. Looking at pressure volume relationships. Helium dilution closed, nitrogen wash and washout open, body plethysmography, which is also known as a body box. That sounds grim now that I think about it. 
I had body bag would have been. All of them. Calculate what? Like the three ways the FRC can get the RV. Like you should know that FRC minus ERV is RV. Okay. That's all I want you to know. Okay. I mean, to be honest with you, you take that lung box, right. and I could give you either values or just say, um, IRV plus ERV plus um, VT equals what? All right, let's talk about the three of these. You don't need to know this. I'm never going to test you on how the nitrogen washout test is done. But let me just kind of go through the three of these just so you kind of get an idea. With the helium dilution, what we have is a container with helium. Not a great amount, but a, a certain percentage of helium. Let's say it's 5%. It's for argument's sake. At the end of a normal exhalation, so at FRC, <laughs> I open, I open this little valve and I allow the patient to breathe back and forth with this mixture of helium. In our lungs, we have no helium. I'm going to just say that out, out loud. I have 5% helium in this container. I'm now breathing back and forth from that source. What's going to eventually happen is you're going to equilibrate. And the amount of helium that's in your lungs, the percentage is exactly the same percentage that's in this box. So at full e equal equilibrium, let's say I have 1.2% here, I have 1.2% here. It doesn't add up, does it? Well, you get the idea. <coughs> doesn't necessarily have to add up to five. but So at some point, this rebreathing process, what's in my lungs and what's in my, um, and what's in the box are the same. <clears throat> and I'll know that because the helium percentage no longer changes on, on, on this little gauge that, that's here. It'll, it'll just be straight lines because now it's spread out evenly across couple of key factors. First of all, this is a closed system. So for, the, for three, four, five minutes, however long it takes to, for equilibration to happen, somebody's got their mouth around a mouthpiece, breathing in and out. No leaks. Did I mention that you can't have any leaks? No leaks. Closed system. Did I want any helium to leak out? Yeah. It's, no, this is a closed circuit. This is helium dilution. Nitrogen washout is the open. Okay? That's okay. Now, just from a technical standpoint, a couple of things that is required. One, I have to have something within the circuitry to absorb carbon dioxide. Otherwise, the patient would be rebreathing her own exhaled gas, and they would eventually pass out. Okay, so there's something inside here that's going to remove CO2. Otherwise, the patient will pass out. Also, there's got to be a small amount of O2 added. because otherwise, again, they pass out. And it's never a good thing when they pass out during a test and you got to you know, fill out forms and stuff. So we don't want that to happen. Make sense so far? Okay. Helium dilution, closed circuit. And then there's a fancy formula that they plug the numbers into and they get this magical determination of FR. 
Do I care that you know anything else beyond the fact that it's, an, that it's a closed circuit? No. We're measuring FRC through a closed circuit system. No leaks. And you try telling an 84-year-old person to keep their lips wrapped tightly around a mouthpiece for four or five minutes. Ain't easy. That's why the good Lord made duct tape. Oh, just kidding. Open circuit. Open circuit is the nitrogen washout. With the nitrogen washout, I'm not necessarily um, rebreathing the gas. Rather, what I'm doing is at FRC, I open a valve where I'm breathing 100% oxygen. So instead of breathing room air, instead of breathing 21% oxygen, I'm now only breathing 100%. And when I exhale, so I in, this is in, this is out. When I exhale, I'm collecting that gas. And at the same time, I'm monitoring their nitrogen that they're exhaling, the percent nitrogen. Eventually what will happen if I breathe 100% oxygen is eventually I'll get to the point in time where there's no more nitrogen being exhaled. It's zero. Because I'm washing all the nitrogen out because I'm only breathing 100% oxygen. Does that make sense? I'm displacing all the nitrogen that's in my lungs because I'm breathing 100% O2. The time it takes to get to that washout is directly related to the FRC. So again, I'm measuring functional residual capacity. But it's an open circuit. They're not rebreathing their gas. So they both measure FRC? Yep. All three of these guys do. That's what the previous slide said. And if I subtract off the extra reserve volume, I have a determination of what the residual volume is. Last one is the body box. And I would say the vast, vast majority of physicians' offices where they do these measurements or hospitals where they do these measurements, they use body box. That's the, most, that's the preferred method nowadays. And as is pictured, the patient sits inside of a box, literally, plexiglass box, and they have their mouth onto a mouthpiece. If I know the volume of the box and I know the pressure that's inside the box and I monitor the pressure change at the patient's mouth, I can determine what the volume is inside their lungs, according to Boyle's Law. And what we have the patient do is at the end of a normal exhalation, at FRC, I have them pant, <laughs> like a spaniel. And from that, we can determine what the volume of air is inside their thorax, the FRC. That's a simplified explanation of how it's done. What do I want you to know? Body plus osmography or body box Boyle's law. Am I going to make you calculate this? No. What am I measuring? FRC. FRC, FRC. Question. Why the heck am I doing all these stupid measurements? Well, because I'm bored. Because we need revenue. No, that's not it. We want to classify the lung disease that is present. All diseases of the lung <coughs> can be placed into one of two categories. 
either obstructive or restrictive. I don't care which lung disease you tell me, I, I can put it into one of those two boxes. We're going to classify, or the, the way to remember the obstructive diseases is the phrase CBABE. Cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, which is probably one people have never heard of. Cystic fibrosis you might have heard of. Asthma, chronic bronchitis, not acute bronchitis, like Sherry has, and emphysema. The latter two, <coughs> chronic bronchitis and emphysema, they often, often go hand in hand. The thing that causes emphysema and causes bronchitis, cigarette smoking, they just kind of blend together. So we give them the name COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Because of yeah, Jeannie will talk about it next, next semester. But they kind of just go together more often than that. Restrictive, obstructive. Well, how do I know which is which? Is which? Obstructive disease processes have the characteristic that they can't get the air out. Can't get the air out. <coughs> and if I look at measuring their flow, they have a flow limitation. Obstructive lung diseases typically are related to airway problems. Not so much parenchyma, not so much lung tissue as airway. Can't get the air out. Melanie, did you say that you, had, you, had, you had asthma? Would you characteristic as can't get the air out? Yeah. No, most people don't. They say I can't get I can't get any air in. But you can't get any air in because you can't get it out. It sounds it sounds back asswards, but it truly is the fact that there's so much trapped gas. Because they can't get air out, that means there's always something trapped inside. Trying to put something else on top of that is hard to do. And that's why the sensation is I can't get my air. You're actually in, in truly during an asthmatic attack and during every other obstructive disease, you have a lot of gas trapped inside your thorax. What's that called? Oh, that's called a residual volume is increased, or the FRC is increased, or the TLC is increased. Classically, what we see with patients with obstructive lung disease is they have a lot of trap gas, literally to the extent that, the, that their diameter of their thorax increases, something we call barrel chest. Under normal circumstances, the AP distance is less than the lateral distance. These patients get such chronic air trapping that their chest actually becomes round, like a barrel. So their AP diameter increases. And one day you'll be standing there, you know, at Target, and the guy in front of you goes, wow, I'll bet he's got COPD. I'll bet he has an obstructive disease process because I can see his chest is this mel shaped You can see it in a lot of their accessory muscle usage, yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a real hard time getting a breath in simply because there's so much trap gas. Mm -hmm. So they have an increase in residual volume, functional residual capacity, total lung capacity. They also have limitations of airflow. 
their ability to exhale is reduced because they can't get the air out. The speed at which they can exhale goes down because their airways. See, that kind of sounds like something to do with Pousset's law somewhere along. Oh, sorry. Something to do with airway. Oh, yeah, airway resistance. Yeah, right. Maybe there's a reason why we have to learn all those stupid things. Just saying. Can't get the air out. Obstructive lung disease. Can't get the air in. Restrictive lung disease. In this case, all those lung volumes are all reduced. <clears throat> Key part is there's not any flow limitation. Their flow rates are totally normal. And this is more the lung tissue itself the asinus or the parenchyma is where the damage is. I'll make a caveat to that also. Chest wall. Those are examples of restrictive lung diseases. Okay, so um, things like pneumonia <laughs> things like ARDS, things like hyphoscoliosis, um, Quasimodo from Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? It isn't. It is. It, flow rates are related to airways. This isn't an airway problem. This is either chest wall. This is a oh. Oh, well, hold on here. How about if we do, do, do this? Resistance. Compliance. These are people who have problems with lung compliance. Their lung or their chest wall is stiff. Resistance is obstructive. Sorry if I went too quickly there. That says re re resistance. So it's a low compliance. I'm sorry? Low compliance. Who? Low compliance. Restrictive lung. Right. Yes. These have an increased re resistance. Stiff lung, stiff chest wall, either or. One of the gals I went to school with, we were talking about restrictive lung diseases. She never wanted children. Never did end up having, have, have, having, any, have, having said that. Um, but she said pregnancy was a restrictive lung disease. And I said, well, mm -hmm. come on. Pregnancy is not a disease. <laughs> she considered it a disease. But it's a restrictive lung process, absolutely. You get nine months pregnant, you got that baby pushing up on the diaphragm, diaphragm can't move. It's a restrictive process. Can't get the air in. Not that I've been pregnant and I can att attest to this, but uh, I'm just saying. Okay. So part of our process of being a respiratory therapist is we go through and we assist the physician in determining if this is a restrictive or, a or an obstructive process. Because treatment's totally different. The way I treat asthma is totally different than the way I treat ARDS. The way I treat cystic fibrosis is totally different than the way I treat a chest wall of deformity. They have different man clinical manifestations. They have different um, uh, ways that we have to treat them. Now this is out of vegan. That's that one big thick book that you probably use as a doorstop long about now. And you can see, hey, that's Rick's, Rick's lung box in the middle, isn't it? This is what they are under normal conditions. When I have an obstructive process, notice what happens. Residual volume gets bigger, FRC gets bigger, 
TLC gets bigger. Why? Because there's trapped gas. Can't get the air out. Notice what happens with a restrictive process. Everything gets smaller. They're all smaller. Make sense? Can't get the air out, I trap gas. FRC, RV, TLC get bigger. Can't get the air in, everything's smaller. Scrunch down. So what will eventually get to the point is, by looking at some lung volume measurements, we can be able to say this is obstructive or this is restrictive. Now, can you have both? Unfortunately, yes. My old buddy Gilbert, patient I used to have, he was, he was probably 60, looked like he was 90. Gilbert had horrendous kyphoscoliosis. And he smoked three packs a day. Dude, you got a problem. His normal PaO2 was probably about 30. Walking around, the PaO2 is 30. I don't know how he did, did that. That's not compatible with life. But he had horrible obstructive, horrible restrictive. We called it, obviously, a mixed but I will never do that to you. I won't, I won't give you a mixed situation because there, there takes a little bit more sophistication to figure out. For right now, we'll just put them into one of those two boxes. Can't get the air in, can't get the air out. Okay? And I think we'll stop that. Someone has been able to photograph the pot at the end of the rainbow. Questions? 